This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Ladies and gentlemen, geeks, <laughs> visible and invisible octopuses, welcome. I am greatly touched by the honour of speaking to you today, and to repay your kindness, I propose to unveil what will, my research team thinks, be a truly historic announcement. Why we have chosen this forum will eventually become clear. As many of you may have heard on the grapevine, the research team I have constructed has been built up from experts across many disciplines, with members coming from across the University of London, but also numerous app quotidian operatives from the Diffuse College, from the International Necronautical Society, from members of the White Visitation, that counterintelligence team of uh, the Wing of Pisces, of course, and some graduate students borrowed from Dr. Nathaniel Wingate Peasley of Miskatonic University, of course, well known for his veritably awesome skill at interpreting complex figures, I quote from his own CV. <laughs> the team has been assembled in emergency conditions due to the nature of our discovery. And I thank all of those colleagues, alive and dead, for their hard work, even though we're only just at the beginning of a long process. Let us get to our subject. As many of you here are cultural uh, critics and theoreticians, you will probably know the story of the remnants of the archive of Walter Benjamin, which is now mainly held in Berlin. Benjamin was an obsessive archivist and collator of his own works and projected works too, leaving papers, notebooks, stashes of postcards, and portions of his library among friends dotted across Europe as he sought safety from persecution in his stateless state. The reconstitution of his library in Paris after his permanent exile from Berlin in 1933 was all too brief. His friends and intellectual allies, Adorno, Horkheimer, and others, worked obsessively to bring these papers together and into print after the war and in the wake of Benjamin's desperate suicide and misburial in the village of Port Bou in 1940, on the, fr the French-Spanish border. For many scholars, the most triumphant victory against the attempt of fascists to erase the traces of Benjamin's thought was no doubt the transcription and publication of hundreds of pages of the Passage in Berg, a complete edition of which was finally published with full scholarly apparatus in German in 1982, and in English translation as the Arcades Project in 1999. As my colleague Professor Esther Leslie has noted, there is a certain fetishism attached to the material traces of Benjamin's archive. The recent exhibition and book, The Archive of Walter Benjamin, pours over these remnants, the brute materiality of these convolutes or bundles of paper, the photographs, the postcards, the gnomic systems of annotation used by Benjamin. The scholars of the archive lovingly detail the tiny handwriting, uh, the spatial distribution of his notes, the type of notebooks Benjamin used, the paper he requested especially from Berlin after his exile in order to ensure that the pages of the archaic manuscript be kept uniform. These texts are therefore some of the most over-fetishized archival materials of modern times. Given that quality of attention, what we announce is rather astounding. There is another previously overlooked convolute amongst these papers. It has rested there, not quite in plain sight, it is true, but rather in what we might call an odd cross-hatched space between other bundles. It has been curiously overlooked, or perhaps actively unseen, by all previous Benjamin scholars. Indeed, it took an expert in the geometry of infolding and weightanancy, an ab mathematician, to see that there was something obtruded in these papers, inserted at an angle impossible in conventional Euclidean geometry. It was only when Professor Johann Zollner of Leipzig University examined the archive that the convolute was discovered. Zollner remains, after all, even 130 years after his death, the world's leading expert in fourth dimensional space. So, between convolute N on the theory of knowledge, theory of progress, and convolute O, prostitution, 
gambling, is this extra text, uh, mathematically inserted and seemingly invisible except to those who have expertise in extreme librarianism or in a, tra or a training in non-Euclidean archivism. For obvious reasons, we have chosen to name this text Convolute N plus 1. This document only came to light in January of this year and has been kept secret until now. I have to acknowledge here that the status of this document is controversial, even to those who have been working so closely with it. The convolute appears to be consistent with the structure of Benjamin's note-taking, the text being built up largely from citations from elsewhere, some sourced and some not, and with the occasional naming utterance from the compositor himself. It appears to be in Benjamin's handwriting, and we know how much importance Benjamin invested in graphology. He had a true mystical belief that handwriting uh, could reveal truth. Yet because these texts and images appear to be an accumulation of citations and images from the early years of the 21st century, many from the year 2012, uh, and many about London, a city Benjamin never visited, the majority view of the research team is that this must either be a later alien insertion into the manuscripts, which of course travelled from Georges George Bataille in Paris to New York, 1947 and then back to Berlin after the war, or else is a hoax perpetrated perhaps by disgruntled postgraduates to mock their elders and betters. <laughs> this is, of course, possible. There is a more radical interpretation, nevertheless. If Benjamin had himself mastered in folding and the manipulation of outspace to insert this secret annex, might he not also have mastered the ability to manipulate time too? Could this document be the trace of Benjamin's first and only visit to London, not in his lifetime, but somehow beyond or beside it? Had he unlocked the secret that the Parisian passages, those arcades with which he was so obsessed, were also via ferrai or Rue Sauvage, those fugitive and mercurial urban pathways that allow one, so it is said, to worm so unpredictably through space and time? After all, remember what Esther Leslie affirms, Benjamin wrote consciously for the future, constructing from early on archives of his writings. Perhaps we can soon add, Benjamin wrote consciously from the future. But I am not able to assert this with confidence just yet. I therefore bow to the wisdom of my colleagues and my referees for promotion, and will presume that the compositor of these texts is not actually Dr. Benjamin. Well, here I am, amid the salvage. What I must do now is lay this text before you and open the discussion of the status of this text and what it might mean to this convocation, this consortium, this weird council. So the convolute contains two elements, hence two screens. And first, I need to talk about the visual component. This enfolded envelope is titled with two words divided by solidus, city, sliver. Inside was a modern memory stick, a digital storage device, but protected in an ancient, cracked, bakelite kind of substance, a material usually associated with the 1930s. This suggests a hybrid tech, perhaps moil technology, perhaps a previously unseen combination of new salvage and archive salvage. On it are a sequence of 84 photographs, mostly uncaptioned, a very few with titles or attendant text. Such images are consistent with Benjamin's interest in photography and postcard images. We know, of course, that he knew and collected the work of surrealist photographers like Suzanne Kroll, but these seem more like street snaps, sites or incidents captured very amateurishly, perhaps by the author of the convolute himself on some tiny, astonishing machine that Although there has been little analysis of these images so far, it seems to me that they form a silent companion to the text, a montage, if you will, to accompany the collage of words. Since I have little time, I will launch this visual bundle and merely invite contributions from the floor that might help the research team to identify sources. So, Herr Doctor, could you open the screen? It should be just be right click and resume. Yeah. And this should be on a cycle of, um, of, of images, and, and uh, the hair doctor will tell me if it's not working. The second part 
is a written manuscript of about 5,000 words, principally in the form of citations. I will only be able to dig into these texts in this forum, but I want to offer you a trajectory through them, as it is my firm belief that this particular audience here today is well situated to help us solve this unprecedented research problem. For those of you who are interested, I do have a very small number of the whole conduit available at the end of this lecture. Let us begin. The manuscript is organised first with what must be taken as a preface, followed by four distinct sections. The three epigraphs are two self-citations and one other. And I hope you can uh, read this. But I'll read them out, don't worry. The first citation, a very famous one from Conrad N. Method of this project, literary montage. I needn't say anything, merely show. I shall purloin no valuables, appropriate no ingenious formulations, but the rags, the refuse. These, though not inventory, but allow in the only way possible to come into their own by making use of them. And then, from the other side of this insertion from Convolute O, the ideal of shock-engendered experience is the catastrophe. This becomes very clear in gambling. By constantly raising the stakes in hopes of getting back what is lost, the gambler steers towards absolute ruin. And then a third citation, which is unsourced. In an unremarkable room in a nondescript building, a man sat working on very nondescript theories. The man was surrounded by piles of books like battlements around him. He cropped them open upon each other. He cross-referred them, seeming to read several at the same time. These are followed by um, four major sections of this convolute. They are numbered and titled 1. Higher space, n plus 1 dimensionality, 2. City, 3. Weird space, and 4. Slither. The work concludes with a section titled Seven Weird Theses. The first section is without doubt the hardest and most puzzling to grasp. It would seem that the compositor was gathering citations on the emergence of non-Euclidean geometry in the 19th century, n dimensional thinking, in the wake of the revolutionary mathematical work of Bernard Riemann, Felix Klein, and in Britain, W.K. Clifford. There are long citations from Johann Zollner, on the space of four dimensions from 1878, and from Charles Howard Hinton, the eccentric author of scientific romances published in Britain in the 1880s that popularised the notion of the fourth dimension. The citation, for example, here reads, in pursuing it, the mind passes from one kind of intuition to a higher one, and with that transition, the horizon of thought is altered. It becomes clear that there is a physical existence transcending the ordinary physical existence. And one becomes inclined to think that the right direction to look is not away from matter to spiritual existence, but towards the discovery of the conceptions of higher matter, and thereby of those material existences whose definite relations to us are apprehended as spiritual intuitions. I can now lay it down as a verifiable fact that by taking the proper steps, we can feel four-dimensional existence, that the human being somehow and in some way is not simply a three-dimensional being. It is followed by a short quotation that reads, the possible law of which I speak is the interpenetration of worlds, the limitations of time and space, three-dimensional space, fill up and disappear, W.T. Stead, 1893. Stead, as you may be aware, was another late Victorian mystical thinker, an influential journal journalist and spiritualist, who died on the Titanic in April 1912, only to return in spectral form for decades afterwards. There is an added nomic addendum, five words from the compositor. Exemplary, hauntological space, read, black lot. Some of these annotations, we confess, we have yet to fully understand. <laughs> What follows are very much more recent quotations or sustained observations. There is a quote from the architect and writer Rem Koolhaas, um, who features again later in the convoot. It reads, There was once a polemic about the right angle and the straight line. Now the 90th degree has become one among many. In fact, remnants of former geometries create ever new havoc, offering forlorn nodes of resistance that create unstable eddies. Newly opportunistic flows. 
Who would then claim responsibility for this sequence? There follows a, a more overtly framed entry, and this means it becomes a little less naming uh, as it goes on. This is the um, statement. I should say, of course, that the bold um, uh, statements are, are by the compositor, I think, and uh, the, the ones in, not, in, not in bold are pure quotation. Hyperbolic space. Margaret and Christine Verfein, the Institute for Figuring, California. The Institute's interests are twofold, the manifestation of figures in the world around us and the figurative technologies that humans have developed through the ages. From the physics of snowflakes and the hyperbolic geometry of sea slugs to the mathematics of paper folding, the tiling patterns of Islamic mosaics and graphical models of the human mind, the Institute takes its purview uh, it takes as its purview a complex ecology of figuring. And then a comment. Can it be true, what they say, that the negative curvature of hyperbolic space, the Riemann space, was considered impossible, purely theoretical, but was solved by a woman scientist crocheting it into existence, whilst the men argued? This, at least, we can grasp a little better, because the quote here can indeed be tracked to an institute for figuring, which does appear to exist, at least in a quasi-real fashion. The quotation derives from their mission statement on their website, and Margaret and Christine Verfein do appear to combine a feminist aesthetic practice of intervening in institutional spaces, to combine, uh, sorry, to, with elaborate interstitial and entirely crocheted and crowdsourced niche ecologies that create wooden reefs of hyperbolic geometries in the august halls of the Smithsonian and elsewhere. This is the first clue that this material is being gathered for an aesthetic rather than purely esoteric mathematical end. The work done by the Institute for Figuring is like aesthetic reappropriations of the images of Poincaré circles, for example, and other representation devices that attempt to convey hyperbolic space. The aesthetic logic in the first part of the convolute is something that becomes clearer in some of the material of the last two entries of this section. And here I transcribe just a few portions of them. First, Lovecraft's doggerel. Some complex fruit of multiple dimensions with modern outlines and remote pretensions which scorning Euclid and the pedant race revolts from time and flings a sneer at space. Second, the longest comment yet from the compositor. For him, everything is encapsulated in the phrase, an angle which was acute, but behaved as if it were obtuse. Reality is skewed, possibly skewered, we can't quite read the text here, with the pure huts part of language. See it in the London book. London's growing fake public space abjures the back street and alleyway gestalt of the city. It and its planners have little room for any urban contingency where railway bridges cut low over streets on their own business, at angles that make no sense from below, forming strange obliques and acutes with the houses they meet. Well, a rather callow young scholar in the Diffuse College has helped identify the quote here, the first quote, and an angle which was acute and so on, uh, to a short text called The Call of Fulu, published by a certain H.P. Lovecraft in 1926. It ties the two citations together in that Lovecraft was evidently concerned to create an eccentric form of secular Gothic literature from his admittedly rather rudimentary understandings of non-Euclidean geometry. Lovecraft was, of course, Benjamin's contemporary in the 1920s and 30s, and although knowledgeable to some extent in German philosophy from his bedtime reading of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Lovecraft took a somewhat different political position from Benjamin. <laughs> Nevertheless, this oddity of the figure, Lovecraft, appears to form something of a crucial pivot in the trajectory of the convolute M plus one, as we shall see. The mention of this unsourced London book remains a puzzle, yet it serves the compositor as the means to move directly from n-dimensional geometry into the longest set of citations, which focus in the second part on the city. The city begins with these three statements, which act less like epigraphs and more as protective hexes. Don't fucking tell me about secret cities. Don't. 
The old man Fitch, maundered about back streets and hidden histories, described pentacles in the banalities of town planning, and then, in the compositor's own words, deliver us from psychogeographical temptation. The usual problems of non ascription apply. However, nearly everything else in this section is carefully sourced, and we can see that the compositor accumulates quotes from, I won't show these, but from Bruno Schulz's short story, Cinnamon Shops, a transcription from the poem Reader for Those Who Live in Cities by Benjamin's friend and ally Bertolt Brecht, two transcribed paragraphs from Walter Benjamin's own much revised and reshuffled work, Berlin Childhood 1900, one of these being a vignette called The Crooked Street, and a passage from a novel called Chameleon Town by Sam Thompson, which appeared in the year 2012. I certainly don't have time to pause very much on these citations, which serve almost as a commonplace book at this point, and instead want to pick out only three significant citations. The first is a quotation from the French critic <coughs> Maurice Davy, who sadly died uh, earlier this year, you might know. I read this, I read this without comment. A city, insofar as it is one of the places where space is most strongly condensed and structured, is, in this regard, the fantastic space par excellence. The, mo the more space is organized, the more it incites dream and calls for the compensations of the, of the irrational. If there is a favorite motive in fantasy, it is that of the ville double, the real city, the diurnal city with its streets, its bridges, its churches, the city of maps and charts, which suddenly blurs, dissolves in an opaque mist. On its site is left a dream city, certainly as real, but black, malefic. And then the compositor adds, sometimes novels are actually footnotes to pre-existent scholarship reversing the usual order of things. The second quotation is from Siegfried Krakauer's short essay, a very strange essay, called Two Planes, a piece that we know Krakauer wrote in 1926, the year incidentally of the Call of Thulu, after visiting Marseille in the company of Walter Benjamin. For me, this text is the crux of the convolute N plus one, uh, that could be Krakauer himself, mm -hmm. well, 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 um, outlining, uh, the, for, sorry, for me, the text is the crux of comedy N plus one, outlining a dynamic, or perhaps a dialectic, in the space of the city. I'll cite only the relevant passages from this long quotation, which is virtually the whole essay in the convolute. First, the bay. Marseille, a dazzling amphitheatre, rises around the rectangle of the old harbour, the three shores of the square paved with sea, whose depths cut into the city are lined with rows of facades. In the spongy depths of the harbour quarter, the fauna of humanity is teeming, and in the puddles, the sky is pristine. The mass of humanity in which the peoples of different nations blend together is flushed through avenues and bizarre streets. Then, uh, the quadrangle, a longer quote, but I'll read it all. The quadrangle, Whoever the place finds did not seek it. The alley, alleys, crumpled paper streamers are laced together without knots. Cross beams traverse the soil wrinkles, rubbing against plaster, plummeting into the depths of basins, then ricocheting back to their starting point. A backstairs quarter, it lacks the magnificent ascending entrances. Greyish green smells of sea waste come smouldering out of the open doors. Little red lamps lead the way. In the, space, in the spaces that afford a view, one finds improvised backdrops, rows of flying buttresses, Arabic signs, stair windings. If one leaves them behind, they are torn down and reconstituted at a different site. Their order is familiar to the dreamer. A wall heralds the square. It stands sleeplessly erect, sealing off the labyrinth. It is a quadrangle which has been stamped into the urban tangle with a giant template. In this tangle of pictorial alleys, no one seeks the quadrangle. After painstaking reflection, one would have to describe its size as moderate. But once its observers have settled into their chairs, it expands towards the four sides of the world, overpowering the pitiful, soft, private parts of the dream. It is a square without mercy. I think, I think, I begin to under understand or discern the core dialectic at work here. 
between hassanized planned urban space of the official city and the sliver of back streets, of winding polyspatial and polytemporal Rue Sauvage. The section ends uh, with a last quotation, this time from the architectural theorist Nadia Amoroso. It poses a question that the subsequent sections appear to, set, to be set up to answer. How can the abstract forces shaping urban life be rendered artistically, spatially, and informatively in the form of alternative maps which represent the urban invisibles and are not usually accessible to routine professional expertise such as the urban designer or architect or the ordinary <coughs> urban dweller? In what ways do the new visualizations provide deeper insights into the city than conventional maps are capable of revealing? We will examine mapping representations and methods that reveal the unacknowledged of the city, reviewing the contemporary history and theory of mapping explorations in terms of exposing the invisible forces that shape our urban environment. What follows is a section that seems oddly provisional and anxious. It has two titles that are scored out. First, Junk Space, then the Kefahuchi Tractatus, before finally settling on three, Weird Space. The first entry is also cancelled out. A long transcription of a famous passage from Freud's essay, The Uncanny, about getting lost in an Italian city. At the end, everyone knows this quote, it's a very famous quote. At the end, the comment is simply appended, precisely not this. What follows, as if in answer, is the longest single citation in the whole conduit. It is taken from a novel called Empty Space, A Haunting, by M. John Harrison, and this also appeared in the early summer of 2012. And let me read uh, just these quotations that are uh, inserted here. When the Kefahuchi tract expanded in what came to be known as the event, parts of it fell to earth on planets all along the beach. Event sites appear everywhere, sometimes in deserts or polar ice fields or at the bottom of the sea, but often alongside the cities. They were assembly yards of the abnormal, zones where physics seems to have, seemed to have forgotten its own rules, expanding into the real world via a perimeter of fogs, hallucinations, half glint, glimpsed movements. From inside could be heard confused laughter, big music, the sound of machinery. Something was being produced in there. Obsolete objects came fountaining out. They were highly energetic and abnormally scaled. Rains of enamel badges, cheap rings, wind-up plastic toys, nuts and bolts, cups and saucers, horse, horses and cars, feathers, doves and black lacquered boxes, conjures, props, the size of houses. They burst into the air above the roofline, then toppled back and vanished. A blueprint unfolded itself across the sky, then folded itself up again and faded away. No one minded these illusions, if illusions they were. But artifacts and inexplicable new technologies came out of the event site too, and sought a foothold on our side of things. Some of them were conscious and looked human. They wandered into the cities and tried to become a part of life. That was when things went wrong. And then, as if to reiterate this opposition between Freud's uncanny space and Harrison's <coughs> empty, haunted space, the next quotation staged this dialectic again, this time contrasting the category of junk space against salvage punk. Categories that appear initially similar, yet which the compositor seems to exist, have a fundamentally different logic. Not this, he says, of Ren Kulhas's junk space. Junk space is what remains after modernization has run its course, or more precisely, what coagulates while modernization is in progress, its fallout. Modernization had a rational program to share the blessings of science universally. Junk space is its apotheosis or meltdown. Restore, rearrange, reassemble, revamp, renovate, revise, recover, redesign, return, the Parthenon and marbles, redo, respect, rent, verbs that start with reproduce junk space. And then, uh, uh, as a counterpoint, but this. Salvage punk, salvage punk is the post-apocalyptic vision of a broken and dead world, 
strewn with both the dream residues and the real junk of the world that was, and shot through with the hard work of salvaging, repurposing, day-turning, scrapping. Acts of salvage punks drive against and away from the ruins on which they cannot help but be built and through which they rummage. Salvage punk represents an attempt to think lost social relations via relations to discarded objects. We come then to the final section, Sliver. Um, textually, this appears to be the sketchiest and most provisional section, yet uh, many of you will surely have noticed that the accumulation of visual details over here seems to be uh, particularly focused on varieties of the tentacular slime, and what we must I now, uh, now, I suppose, call slime dynamics. It opens with a large number of stubs of unsourced quotations which are marked examples. Let's just take three inc incidences, the last three as it happens. Above the waist, it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. Then two, two just short stubs, a smoglodytic tentacled squid goat thing, a mongrel of whale shark distended by bow of biothaumaturgy to be cathedral-sized, varicellate shelled, metal pipework thicker than a man in ganglia, protuberant like prolapsed veins, boat-sized fins swinging on oiled hinges, a dorsal row of chimneys smoking whitely. Then underneath, how to transform the Kantian excommunication of disgust, or abolition of disgust, from aesthetics for new urban creatures. I confess I do not entirely understand what this means. Bewilderingly, what follows is a signpost for work not yet done, as if signalling that the work on this particular convolute is already coming to an end. The next entry reads, insert the military quote <laughs> on a hybrid object and heterogeneous assemblages. There follows another long list of quotes in broadly chronological order, from Tennyson's The Kraken through Moby Dick, instances of fungal men in William Hope Hodgson's bizarre novel The Boats of Glengarry, and a section devoted to William Burroughs' terror called The Octopus. The section ends, though, with this odd quotation, Pynchon's Pavlovian Octopus. Octopi, the wrong plural, of course, octopi spectro weedles, are docile under surgery. They can survive massive removals of brain tissue. Their unconditioned response to prey is very reliable. Show them a crab, wham, out with the old tentacle, home to poisoning and supper. And points them, they don't bark. <laughs> well, before we examine the last section, the very last section, we might briefly reflect on how we could begin to interpret this strange addition to the oeuvre of the arcade's project, if that's what it is. The tactic of collage, of course, creates an open grid of multiple possibilities and trajectories through the material, something Benjamin understood and embraced elsewhere in his work. And of course, any one pathway that is chosen must inevitably exclude others. Yet amongst the members of the research team, it must be confessed that factions have already emerged that are united to very strong but very different interpretive lines. There is, for example, a minority amongst us who believe that convolute N plus one constitutes nothing less than a set of contexts for the interpretation of the work of one South Korean artist, the sculptor Uram Cho. Uram Cho, as you are no doubt aware, and I do apologize for my pronunciation if that's incorrect, is a sculptor of animated <coughs> biomechanical creatures around which he has invented an elaborate set of mythic taxonomies and behavioural studies. As one critic explains, in an elaborate pretense of the field of natural history, the artist has allegedly discovered these anima machines, 
living in hidden spots in the modern metropolis. These new urban species, all named with pedantic pseudo-accuracy in a fantasy taxonomy, live on the energy of cities, all uh, often found excuse me, in the airspace above very condensed, globalised city spaces, such as super skyscrapers, and breed by firing photons of energy at each other. Uram Co's uh, Cho's installations are described as natural history, history exhibits from the future in one perceptive review. And the work does indeed seem to occupy a sort of salvage hunk in Terstis. The evidence uh, used by this Menshevik party of the diffuse college to regard convolute M plus one as devoted to this figure is perhaps obvious from the trajectory I have sketched through this material. These are sculptural forms that engage with uncanny animation, monsters that challenge rigid boundaries and taxonomies. They are city-constituted, slithering biomechanisms. There is, in fact, a recurrent image of an Urbanus female lava that recurs in the image files, and the phrase new urban species does recur in the text of the convolute several times, as you might have noticed. We know too that Uram Cho did exhibit in London in the summer of 2012. This is a partial account at best, however, and I am not sure I, I can agree with this interpretation by my august colleagues. I bring this matter to you, of course, because I suspect that the absent centre of convolute M plus one is another London artist who's also featured prominently in the public sphere in London in that same summer. I refer to the writer China Naval, and I defer to your wisdom to see more evidence of this thesis than I am yet able to grasp in the convolute myself. My sense is that what we are grappling with in this text is the beginnings, the very beginnings, of a series of interrelated dialectical readings that are all inscribed inside the overarching opposition of the terms city and slither, which might mean form and deformation, official and subjugated knowledge, the beautiful and the grotesque, pleasure and terror. As a way of concluding, I affirm my interpretation by pointing to the final section of the convolute, which is called Seven Weird Theses. Theses. I can't read them all, uh, but here I think are the key ones. One, the uncanny always goes home. The weird has no home to start with. No oikos, no pure originary state, only non-Euclidean folds and refolds. With no origin, no death drive either, that exhausted geometry, Freudianism disabled. Two, the old weird is premised on terror, the new weird on the possibilities inherent in boundary rupture. In Lovecraft, coupling and collapse leads to pathology, the panic of purification. After Lovecraft, a renegotiation with the legacies of history. Hopeful monsters, new urban species, that phrase again. The weird bursts out of the chest of the old carcass in liberation, not horror. Read, Vint. Three, the weird couples inappropriate things, tangles objects, hence the obsession with the coppola and the ampersand, hence also the love of puns and linguistic games, the insistent collapse or literalisation of metaphors, knuckleheads, marge, we've got feelers out, spare me the literal minded, read Easterbrook. Four, gloss the phrase radicalised sublime backwash, the stub of the numinous torn out like a rotting tooth and flung back at the riot police. Then, sixth, I, I won't read the fifth, too long and complicated. Six, the weird builds worlds precisely to break them open, to breach them. It is in breach. This is profane illumination, not clues, metaphysic or vastation. And then finally, uh, the last and the seventh, which clinches for me so many things and on which it seems appropriate to end. A painting by Clay's lesser known brother, named Tentaculix Nobus, shows an octopus looking as though he's about to move away from something he's fixedly contemplating. 
His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his tentacles are spread. This is how one pictures the octopus of history. His face is turned towards the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his suction cups. The octopus would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing. It has got caught in his tentacles with such violence that the octopus can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. I dedicate this puzzling discovery to you, the audience of this weird council, this consortium, the collective noun for octopus, because I fully believe that it is this assembly of scholars that will truly begin the work of interpretation. Let us commence. dynamic, uh, exciting revelation about Benjamin that perhaps you didn't realise, and the tentacular transcendence of the, uh, the, 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 what's it, the octopus of history, mm -hmm. which I should be looking up straight after this. We have about ten minutes now for questions to Roger, to kick things off. Would anybody like to didn't manage to get the images from it. Yeah. work? No. <laughs> Um, well, um, let's see if we can, um, let's see if we can do something about that while we have 10 minutes at all. Yeah. Um, this might happen. Any thoughts on the previously unseen convoy? <laughs> this is always the way, isn't it? Or oh, response indeed from Mark, who Benjamin is planning to read. Well, I'm, I'm wondering when Roger's going to make this available for all of us. <laughs> you know, there, there are scholars who really want to get into this stuff. <laughs> Well, the, uh, you know, the, the diffuse colleges, you know, there, there are many members of it here, of course, uh, as you know. Um, so um, uh, there are people working on it, and I'm sure it will leak out. Um, I can just kind of run through these and briefly talk about them if you like. I mean, there are there are sort of images of mathematical um, quotations, and lots and lots of sort of street shots um, of, of things that have been um, found and discovered. There is the Urangsha, the first shot of, of, of what is a, an urban female larvas um, in London. More um, city shots. A kind of sense of... Um, uh, Benjamin was obsessed, of course, with noting, taking details of all of the books that he was reading. Uh, and, and in a way, a modern way, I suppose, he was taking photographs of these as well. Um, there's also this um. recurrent image as well uh, <laughs> of, uh, from the Guardian, which is he he headlined. The headline is cut off, so I'm not sure what it's about. Um, <laughs> read it, remix it, re-release it. Uh, images of topology from Benjamin, uh, hyperbolic spaces. Don't know what that is. <laughs> um, screen captures about medieval and spatial folly. Uh, images from which uh, are just we just don't know where they're from. Uh, a sign seen in Golden Square um, earlier this summer. Uh, what have we got here? Yeah, Lovecraft. Um, don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Um, images from uh, a Susan Trister exhibition again was in uh, London in the Science Museum you know, in 2012. So it was signed then that the person was also uh, doing that. Still Life with Squid and Sea Urchin by Lucy Floyd. Um, <laughs> Daniel Hiller, artist, figures, more around show, in fact. Don't know what that is. <laughs> um, images from, um, from texts, again, we're not quite sure where this is from, although we're trying to search rapidly. Images from Israel, from Berlin. Uh, remixed stuff again. Uh, and then shots from London spaces. Um, from um, various sites here and there, more Uremcho. Uh, and so it goes on, really. Do you know what they are? Do you know what they are? Uh, uh, Hegel and so on. So, you know, these images. Uh, uh, squid and subsidy, various, and then it becomes very tentacular, as I was saying at the end. Um, very kind of interested in shots and images uh, like this, 
which you might have seen. Um, people being devoured by their own photographs. Lovecraft, that's another Susan Trister. Uh, just reduced. Um, this was a provisional title for the talk, like with squirming tentacles. Beauty <laughs> um, the Beast. Uh, images from all over the place, really. The sexual depravity of penguins, uh, being discussed in the papers. Re remix it, re release it. More Daniel Hiller, and so on, and so it goes. Um, there it is. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> things that we can't quite work out what they are. Um, Suzanne tries to um, screen grab some fringe, interestingly. That's about it. Go uh, <laughs> uh, Agnes, an Agnes B. Octopus. What's that about? What's that about? Uh, to books that are emerging. Um, Vampire Squid and the Muppets. So, and it ends with um, with that shot of a point carré circle, uh, another representation of the universe. Worth. So that's just to say true. So sorry about that, but it's not they're not particularly uh, the focus of, of the Diffuse College's research at the moment. But we will be working on them and distributing them to um, visual artist members of the collective. Can I ask them, if yes. um, Benjamin or whoever the author, collator may have been, uh, actually discovered in, in, either in the future or in 2012 or possibly in the 30s, I'm not sure what it was, that we should not do the uncanny but the weird, mm. then we may have been wasting about 70 years <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the discourse on the uncanny. But we should that is interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, Benjamin was, was very, very interested in his work now. Uh, I was very interested in um, Freud, obviously, and his work was saturated in the idea of Freud and trauma, particularly uh, ideas. But there seems to be there a, a transition in his thinking, uh, perhaps provoked by the kind of text that he was uh, researching and, and seemingly collating. Um, so there is a very striking kind of move away from that kind of thing, as if um, it won't work with the kind of text that he's looking at. So I think you're right. That is a very striking and important um, if it is Bob Spenny, then a uh, significant shift in his work. I agree. Feels like time you were traditionally in the exhibition. Joe. I'm just sort of thinking in between some of the things that we brought together here. So there was this line that I failed to capture an attempt to rethink social relations through relations to obsolete objects. Yes, or something like that. that's right. And so I, I'm pretty sure this is where this is going. Is the weird necessarily anti-nostalgic? And if so, is it therefore also anti-sentimental? Right. Very good question, which we need to obviously um, ask the compositor. Um, <laughs> my sense is that um, there does seem to be a really kind of crucial uh, focus on on that idea of salvage of something which isn't about sentimental recovery of the past. Um, and that seems to be crucial, and the, the, the citation in that case is sourced, so Evan, Evan called Williams as uh, combined and uneven apocalypse, has this 50 or 60 pages on this idea of, of, of salvage crime, which he claims is a kind of fundamentally uh, politicised, even communist idea of, of trying to leave it open what Benjamin would call elsewhere the dream world of capitalism. So uh, as exactly in the essay on uh, the history of surrealism, uh, Benjamin talks there about them using in, uh, items, artifacts found in flea markets in order to break open this kind of dream world of the contemporary uh, sort of flowering of capitalism. So it is very much leverage rather than nostalgia. It's, it's an opening out by using those discarded phenomena. So I think you're on the right lines there. It seems to me to be very strikingly anti-sentimental work. How can we uh, follow the instruction to read Blacklock? <laughs> well, uh, you know, obviously there are people working on this that uh, we might be able to uh, search. Google is very helpful for this, you know, find uh, some material. Um, all of these young people these days do have blogs, I believe. Uh, so it is possible to read Blacklock. Oh, okay. yeah, uh, but also Blacklock has published too. Can I come out of character yet?
think perhaps we should take a slightly early coffee break to digest some of this amazing <laughs> new discoveries of as we didn't know existed. So please join me in thanking Professor Roger Lester.